you. Good morning and a uh, very warm welcome to the 32nd meeting of the Constitution Europe External Affairs and Culture Committee in 2023. Our agenda item today is um, to take evidence on our past, our future, the strategy for Scotland's historic environment, which was published in June this year. And we're delighted to be joined by Brian Dixon, Head of Buildings and Con Con Conservation at the National Trust for Scotland. Caroline Clark, Director for Scotland of the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Ailsa McFarlane, Director of Built Environment Forum Scotland. Lucy Cassett, Chief Executive of Museums and Galleries Scotland. Jocelyn Cunliffe, Acting Chairman of Architectural Heritage at the Society of Scotland. Elaine Ellis, Skills Planning Ma Manager for Skills Development Scotland. And online, we are joined by Caroline Warburton, Destination Development Director, Central and North East Visit Scotland, who is joining us remotely. And a warm welcome to you all, and a huge thank you for the written submissions for today's session, for those that have, have put them in. Um, it is a round table. It's intended to be slightly less formal, and hopefully we'll, everyone will have a chance to, um, to participate in the discussion. And Caroline, if you indicate on, online, um, the clerks will let me know if you want to come in on any of the points. So, um, so our main focus is, is the views on the three priority areas for the sector, uh, uh, the role of stakeholders in supporting the delivery and strategies aims, the monitoring progress and measuring success of the, the um, strategy, and any potential blockages, risks to delivery or uh, concerns you have going forward. Um, so, if I could open with a question that just says whether you think the priorities for the sector as set out in the strategy are the right ones going forward, and also whether you consider that actions due to be undertaken will be able to deliver the priorities as set out in the strategy. And I'll maybe just go around the room, and if you could just, if you want to say very brief, briefly, because um, we, we will run out of time, we always do, um, a little bit about the your organisation and, and, and then uh, on the, and I'll come to Caroline first. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chair. So the National Lottery Heritage Fund supports um, a broad and diverse range of heritage organisations across the whole of Scotland. So ranging from built heritage, natural heritage, intangible cultural heritage, um, we really um, expect that it's up to organisations applying to us to tell us about the heritage that they care about and we work with them to help them celebrate that. Um, and we fund from community grant levels to major capital projects um, across the country. So we're, we've been very involved in built environment for de the decades that the lottery has been in existence. Um, the, the priorities laid out in this strategy, we really very much welcome. I think that the uh, way that they seek to empower communities to be engaging with their heritage in a meaningful way is something we are keen to see and to um, identify mechanisms and structures to support that. I think the, the breadth of mission in this strategy means that we will need to think very carefully about how to monitor the impact it's having and how to make sure we can measure the change it has over its lifespan. Lucy? Thank you. Yes, so, um, uh, I represent Museums Galleries Scotland and we're the national development body for the museums and galleries sector. So we look after the 450 museums and galleries in Scotland or support them. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things for us is we developed the strategy for um, Scotland's museums and galleries um, sort of in parallel with the development of this strategy. Um, when that came out in February, so it was slightly, slightly ahead, but very much working in that same context. And we work quite closely with HES in sharing some of that experience in the consultation. And one of the things that really struck me from looking through all of the responses was how much there was commonality between the strategies. And I think that that is natural um, in, and also very positive. I think it's really helpful uh, in terms of how we deliver the strategies um, and also within the framework of, of the wider culture strategy that there are those synergies. But because we're all working in the same um, wider context, I think it's good to see that. So I, I think, uh, I th I think it, they are the right priorities. I would agree with Caroline that the centering of people in this strategy is really, really important and a, and a sort of um, step beyond uh, the previous strategy. Are the actions up to the challenge? I think this is one of the things that we're all grappling with, is this has to provide a framework 
within which we can work. The context is changing quite rapidly, so there's more detail I think that would be useful to come out as, as we get into the, the delivery phase for the strategy. But um, broadly, if uh, the, the, the right actions, I think, to try and deliver that and, and the deliverability of them will depend on a, a number of things in, te in terms of the wider context and resource and so on. But uh, we were, a number of us were part of a, there's a chief executive's forum um, that supported the previous strategy, our place in time, and we were also involved in, in the development of, that strat of this strategy. So I'm um, very much supportive of, of what's come out in that. Thanks. Thank you. Jocelyn? Uh, thank you, convener, um, and thank you um, for inviting the Architectural Heritage Society of Scotland uh, to be part of this stakeholder group. Um, apart from the National Trust for Scotland, which does receive funding for specific projects, I think uh, I'm right in saying that we alone, amongst the stakeholders present, don't receive any funding from either the Scottish Government or Historic Environment Scotland. We have in the past received Historic Scotland grant, but we don't now. So, um, as it says at the beginning of the summary, the remit of the Society is to encourage the protection of Scotland's built heritage. Now, it goes beyond built heritage to talk about settings and place, um, but that's our focus. Um, we are we're pragmatic, but we're very conscious that the heritage of Scotland is not a niche interest, it belongs to us all. So we're a campaigning organisation, but we're also an educational organisation. And um, people are, are welcome to um, respond on, on our website to requests for support in dealing, for example, with contentious planning applications. When we were looking at the strategy, one of the things that concerned us was that there wasn't enough emphasis on what we call the day job, which is looking after Scotland's historic buildings. And you'll see in this uh, submission that I've put a lot of focus on maintaining buildings. Now, when I say I've put a lot, in fact, the, um, the submission was collaborative. It, it wasn't just me. It was the National Conservation Committee and others who input into the submission. But we think it's critical that buildings and the public realm are properly maintained, and we don't see that happening. Um, if I go across to Elaine, thanks. Hi, I'm, I'm very, it's great to be here today. Uh, thanks for inviting me along. I'm very conscious I'm probably here from a slightly different role than the um, other participants, that, and you're here representing Skills Development Scotland, and um, we're not directly part of the historic environment sector um, where the other sort of partners are but we do have a very strong role with the sector and we work in great collaboration with them um, in terms of the sort of development of the strategy it was a very collaborative process and it was one that um, colleagues within skills development scotland including myself were part of and took part in the consultations but the consultations definitely went across not just the stakeholders directly from the sector but also across the public sector, it, it was very, very. Um, th there was a. It was very well reached out, uh, sort of across the Scottish landscape, and that was taken into consideration. In terms of the priorities, I think there's sort of two main priorities that really do connect into our space. Um, one is definitely around the net zero set goal, and the challenge around how we retrofit and move our buildings to net zero is a challenge that we ourselves recognise and, and, and definitely connect across. When we developed the Climate Emergency Skills Action Plan, sort of working in, in partnership with other agencies and government, one of the sectors that we put as the priority sector was the sort of construction sector. It was construction and energy efficiency. At the time, we didn't use the language of retrofit because it wasn't so commonly used at that time. If you're developing it tomorrow, I'm sure that language will be right through it. But the, it, we did capture that in, and we're currently working on a Pathfinder project where we're looking at sort of We've done a sort of deep dive into looking at retrofit skills across Glasgow and across Shetland. And the, the challenges around the historic environment are part of that. They're not the only thing within that landscape, but they do, they do feed into it. Uh, and certainly we have within the CSAP, we have a, a, a heat decarbonisation subgroup that was part of that structure. Again, that, that may change as we move forward. But within that, we do have partners from the historic sector and we have Historic Environment Scotland colleagues within that group. So we absolutely recognise these challenges. Um, we also recognise the sort of goals around developing an inclusive and diverse workforce, and that sits across our, our entire remit. Um, we are just one partner in the skills, agents, the skills landscape. We, um, we, we do play an important role, but we only play uh, 
we only work in sort of set areas. But certainly in terms of Historic Environment Scotland, we work with the sector directly with Historic Environment Scotland and across the sector in the development of the Historic Investment Skills Action Plan that was published way back in 2019. That is now currently getting updated, so that is an ongoing process. Historic Environment Scotland are leading on it, but we are one of their partners and working with them on that. So that will, is due to be published early next year. But there has been conversations ongoing to reflect the major changes in the world since 2019, but also to feed into this new strategy. Um, we work with the, in terms of sort of apprenticeship funding, we fund around about 14,000 apprenticeships that are currently live, directly related to these sectors, directly related to the construction sectors, to tourism and to creative industries. And we have many other apprentices and fields that will link across the sector. Now, not every construction apprentice will go into historic, work in historic environment Scotland or, or tourism, but they do have a very important core skill that makes them ready to move into that sector with, and that they're ready and sort of able to go. And again, we've done work around the promotion of careers and we have done development work and we've currently got ongoing development work that relates into apprenticeship frameworks. So for me, uh, you know, the strategy is... I'm very conscious, again, I'm not directly within this sector, but what I can see within the strategy is that they are looking at how to use Historic Environment Scott tools and how to make them become more active. And I think it feels, for me, it feels a very active strategy where they're looking at how to use it for net zero and looking at how to benefit communities, and I think that can only be a good thing. That's great. Ailsa? Thank you, convener, and good morning to everybody. Um, Built Environment Forum Scotland is the third sector intermediary um, for organisations working within the existing built environment. Um, we draw on expense, uh, extensive expertise within um, our membership to inform, debate and advocate for strategic issues across, across the sector. Um, during the formation of the strategy, um, we were the lead for sector-wide engagement. So we... Um, we worked exceptionally hard with the small team at Historic Environment Scotland to reach out across um, the, the breadth of the sector to, to, to gather views. I won't, I, I won't uh, dwell on that because others, others present have, have mentioned it, but I think that ultimately the priorities that we saw come, come through were very much ones that reflected what we heard across, um, across the, the engagement piece. But also, I think more importantly, they reflect a step change in thinking from the previous strategy. Um, which was understandably quite inward-looking and very much cementing the, the, the historic environment um, due to circumstances at the time. But I think that the priorities we see here reflect a sector that is outward-looking and the priorities and the actions demonstrate how the sector delivers across a wide range of areas. So it's... It, their purpose is not just what the sector can deliver against, but it's very much demonstrating the place of the sector as, as working sort of across directorates, across government port portfolios, and not necessarily considered within a silo, I think is, is one of the, the, the key aspects. And I'd say that the, um, the actions in themselves also reflect the breadth of work that exists within the historic environment. And I appreciate that there are a number, um, including myself, of those who work within the built environment present today. But the strategy obviously has a much broader um, reach than that. And I think that that balance is something um, that everybody involved was, was quite keen to, to get across. Um, I think it is fair to say that there is ambition um, within, um, within the, the priorities and, and, and the actions. So not, not everything, um, I, I, I think everybody was keen to avoid easy wins. This shouldn't just be about um, a strategy that reflects what we already do. It's very much about how to push further um, with the sector and, and how to ensure that that's recognised um, wider, than, um, wider than, than the sector itself. Thank you. Brian? Uh, thank you, and uh, thanks for inviting the National Trust for Scotland to come and give representation today. Um, <clears throat> we are uh, uh, Scotland's largest conservation charity, um, so we uh, own and manage around about 130 sites right across um, Scotland. Um, we have a big built uh, portfolio within there, so we uh, look after and manage around about 1,200 built things. Um, so um, we're, we're really quite engaged in the uh, maintenance activity that, that Jocelyn was mentioning as well. 
Um, <clears throat> in terms of the development of the strategy, um, we've just recently launched our own 10-year strategy, Nature, Her uh, Beauty and Heritage for Everyone, which looks ahead to the National Trust for Scotland's 100th anniversary in 2031. So uh, the timing of our creation of that strategy and us feeding into the developing strategy was really good. Um, I think we see a lot of great alignment um, within uh, both strategies. So um, I think from that perspective, it's a be very positive thing. It's been a very collaborative uh, process to, to achieve that. Um, <clears throat> we, um, I, th I think within our submission, we've highlighted a number of challenges and, and I think some of this maybe relates to our activity in the previous strategy, the OPIT strategy, um, when it was created in 2014. Um, so I think that that succeeded very well in bringing the sector together um, and um, produced a number of really useful outputs um, from that. <clears throat> I think um, a number of the, the activity on those outputs has been affected. I think COVID had quite a big impact where a number of those working groups were making um, inroads uh, into uh, certain areas within the, the, the sector. But I think one of the main things that it, it, it didn't quite achieve was that the, sec the, the strategy was viewed as being relevant for a lot more people rather than just the sector, i.e. I, I don't think OPIT managed to become mainstreamed. Um, and I think this is where we are welcoming the uh, change in the language of the, the new strategy. I think from a perspective from caring for our built environment, I think it's important that we've managed to make a narrative shift where um, caring for the built environment helps us achieve net zero. Um, and I think it's been a really useful thing for the, our sector strategy to, to try to articulate in that. There are still an, a great number of challenges though. Um, I think when I look upon our own estate, and the challenges that we face, um, and we believe that um, a, a well-maintained building um, is a, a, a positive attribute, it gives civic pride, but just achieving that is very challenging, both from a financial resource perspective, um, I know our own, own estate is very stretched from that side, but also from a skills perspective as well, and the, the work that Elaine was mentioning um, is absolutely vital uh, in order to achieve the strategy. So I, I think that um, from an NTS perspective, if we um, had the finances to um, deliver a large scale, large scale capital works across Scotland, I don't think we would have the skills available within Scotland in order to deliver that. We, we're a, um, we tend to be a contracting organisation, so we don't have a, a, a large volume of direct labour. So the, the traditional skills out there um, to achieve good quality maintenance repair, let alone robust retrofit, um, it, it's a very shallow pool at the minute. And if there's ambition to deliver the strategy, I think there needs to be a considerable focus on, on that. That's great. And if we go online to Caroline, thanks. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for the invitation to, to uh, join the panel today and thank you for accommodating me last minute to, to go online as well. It's much appreciated. Um, I'm representing Visit Scotland. Uh, Visit Scotland is the national tourism organisation and um, uh, we are very much focused on ensuring the sustainable development and growth of the visitor economy. Um, so that's ensuring that tourism plays its part in building the wellbeing economy um, as outlined in the national strategy for economic transformation and this also aligns very clearly with the Scotland Outlook 2030 which is the national tourism strategy and the three priorities um, in the uh, historic environment strategy align very strongly with both of these strategies and also with the work that we as an organisation are doing. So we're hugely supportive of the strategy, of the priorities um, and also the outcomes which I suspect we might come on and talk about um, uh, uh, later. Um, it is perhaps an obvious statement, but the uh, historic environment is a key part of the tourism industry, um, and we recognise that. Um, so some figures for you in 2019, um, some research that we undertook showed that almost two thirds of international visitors um, saw history and culture as a key driver for their visit to Scotland. So we recognise the importance um, of the historic environment in all its forms right the way across the country. Um, and it's that interplay between tourism, the visitor economy, communities, 
our built and natural heritage that is what makes Scotland um, special. However, I think we also recognise that um, the built environment, the historic environment, is not just for tourists, is not just for visitors. It has to be relevant uh, to communities as well. So uh, we're looking forward to playing our part where we can um, within the tourism industry, um, both as an organisation ourselves, Visit Scotland, but also in helping to engage the tourism industry in the de development and delivery of the, um, of the strategy. In terms of the um, the actions themselves, um, I understand that the delivery plan is still being worked up. Um, so again, we'll be involved in that and happy to play our part. We already partner with many of the organisations in the sector and uh, we're looking forward to, to, to partnering with more as the uh, development and implementation of the strategy goes forwards. Thank you very much. Thank you all for um, those opening statements. I'm going to move to questions to the committee and I can invite Donald to... to Thank you, Claire, um, and welcome to everybody. Um, I'd like to focus on the, on the specific issue of closures of sites and restricted access, um, which I think will be well known to, to everyone here. I mean, as I think every MSP around this table will um, have experience of a closed site within their constituency or region. Um, to be fair to HES, I think there has been improvement according to their website, that there are still, however, 22 sites that are fully closed and more with restricted access. And that has a negative impact uh, on the local economy and on, on tourism. Could I ask for the, the panel's general view uh, on the status quo and particularly how do we get more sites uh, open? And then looking to the future, secondly, um, there's talk of managed, what's called managed decline of various sites, and I would welcome views on that, uh, and, and more widely about um, the effects of climate change and the transition to net zero, which is a key plank of the new, new strategy. Um, so views on that, most welcome. And perhaps, Brian, seeing as you're on my right, you might start. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm very sympathetic to the position that HES find themselves in. I think that um, the resources required to both inspect and undertake regular maintenance to any large estate is substantial. Um, I think all organisations struggle to fund uh, those activities. Um, the, the, generally speaking, the Historic Environment Scotland estate is quite different to our own. Um, I often say an easy way to think about that is that ours have roofs and theirs don't. Um, and that's a great asset to have a roof, I have to say, because what that means is that um, uh, in order to maintain the structure, it's a lot easier to, to do, um, although it still is very challenging. I think one of the things that we um, experience um, with regard to subtly changing climates is the fact that our maintenance programmes have to be more and more robust and more and more active, which involves more and more cost. Uh, and often it's very difficult to argue for maintenance when it's not really a sexy thing to talk about. People like to talk about capital projects and what they achieve, but in order to achieve good, robust maintenance, it's not really a, a topic that tends to feature at the top of an agenda, probably at the bottom of an agenda. So um, I... I I think as well that in a, a line to uh, uh, looking after the built estate, I would just um, reiterate the issues on uh, craft skills. Uh, I think, as you may know, that in Scotland now there is one college that delivers stonemasonry apprenticeships. Um, I often say that Scotland is a nation built of stone, and I don't think that having one college to produce apprentices is a very sustainable um, view uh, and our, our position to, to go ahead. So, um, yeah, in summary, I'm, I'm sym sympathetic. I think there's great challenges for everybody to look after the, their built estate, um, and slightly thankful that we don't have a great deal of roofless ruins across our, our place. Thank you. I don't know if anyone else wants to come in on that. Um, Jocelyn and... Um, thank you. Uh, the Architectural Heritage Society of Scotland, the AHSS, um, has written um, a number of letters on this topic. Um, I would like, on behalf of the AHSS, to ask the committee to explore 
matters of risk with Historic Environment Scotland. When HES was established, I think I'm right in saying that um, the Act of Parliament um, transferred responsibility of properties in care from the Scottish Government to HES. And I think the problems that HES has been facing with properties in care actually go back much, much further than 2014-2015. Um, and that there's a build-up of repairs. There's been a build-up of repairs going way back in time. But part of the closure, I think we'll find, is the point at which the bar was set. They are risk-averse. Now, I'm not saying it's right or wrong to be risk-averse, but it's how you judge where you set the bar. And I think if the Scottish Government had liability for the risk, the view might be different because the, it's a bit like COVID inquiry. The damage that's been done to the economy by the closure of sites might have a sort of balancing act. Um, some places where there's been stonefall, stonefall into a moat where people are not going is not a high risk, whereas stonefall at a gatehouse where people are going is a high risk. Um, there's a lot of talk about uh, the climate emergency. Yes, we know rainfall is a lot heavier, that the storms are much more intense, that there are temperature changes. I remain a bit unconvinced that the temperature changes in Scotland have been so dramatic that that's a big problem, but I do think the rainfall is, and I do think um, old pointing and building methods um, have impact. Um, so, yeah, anything this committee can do to persuade there to be greater investment in the, um, the high-level skill, uh, the high-level inspections that are being take, taken place. And Ailsa and I were at um, a meeting of the BEFS Historic Environment Working Group when we heard from Craig Menz, the Director of Operations at HES, about their programme to reopen. Um, they're working through it methodically, but I think not quickly enough. Um, I don't know if that contributes it's, to the it's discussion. Okay. It's, all, it's all very helpful. Is anyone else? Caroline, did you want to come in? Yes, I, I suppose um, I just wanted to add I have, um, like Brian, sympathy with the challenges facing Historic Environment Scotland. And um, as Jocelyn says, risk is something to be considered. And I think on a publicly accessible site, safety has to come first, but I think the bigger picture to think about in terms of this strategy is that here we have an organisation resourced and expert enough to identify where those risk areas are, but presumably the same climate change impacts will be being felt across the built environment in all our, all our building stock that we have. So I, I feel they are more of a canary in the coal mine where the impacts we're seeing now are because they can see them, but there will be a lot of um, challenge in estates owned by private individuals, by NHS, by Department of Defence, you know, the, the impacts of this are really going to be very severe in future years. And so, again, as um, we're really at the start of feeling the impacts of the climate change in a tangible form, I think it would be very sensible for us to be trying to future-proof. And again, that does come down to skills and also identifying how to manage the change we need to see happening in our built environment. Um, well so that we're preserving and conserving the historic building stock as best as we can while making the necessary adaptations. I was going to flag that we are supporting RSPB Scotland to do some interesting work around um, the fourth, uh, climate fourth it's called, looking at adaptation planning, um, not just for the natural environment as sea levels are so seen to rise, but also um, doing some piloting around the impact on the cultural and built environment in the, in the fourth area. And I think that doing more innovative testing work on how we're going to do this in areas of particularly um, high risk of flooding or other impacts of climate change is something that would be very sensible to be doing now early so that we can begin to implement that um, over the duration of the strategy. Does any, any other um, panel member want to come in on closure? I think we've got okay. some supplementaries around this area. Um, is yours a supplementary, Mark? Um, is it a new area? It, it's kind of a new area, really, yeah. Uh, can yeah. I go to Kate first? Who's got yeah. I, I suppose it's the, the inverse of uh, Donald Cameron's question, and it's about 
new sites that are identified, which perhaps have been uh, forgotten about or are indeed, in Brian Dixon's words, becoming ruthless. And obviously, it's not only Historical Environment Scotland that own historical buildings, but where there are other properties, uh, and I don't want to name check any in particular, not least uh, Kinloch Castle on the Isle of Rum being an obvious example, where perhaps they are a key part of our historical environment, but are not being treated as such right now. What is the process for, and some of these are questions are, are better for Historical Environment Scotland, but from your perspective, what do you think should be the process for identifying key assets like that and ensuring that they are part of a collection, irrespective of who the owner is? And where does responsibility ultimately lie, not only in terms of identification, but also in terms of ensuring that they are not lost? Um, I, I was going to suggest that Ilsa might want to come in about work that we've done within the sustainable, uh, the built environment working group and the sustainable investment tool, which, which I think is um, one consideration when it comes to looking at, at, at um, heritage generally. Um, I think, generally speaking, we've tended to uh, look through a lens of the sort of cultural value of, a, of an object um, and um, we, the, the sector um, has probably been guilty of doing that for, for quite a while. There's been, there's been some really interesting work um, undertaken out of one of the previous OPIC groups um, that developed a toolkit to look at the heritage site but to consider a much broader range of values, not only cultural values but economic, environmental and social values. So I think that that tool helps to um, articulate the values of a particular site. Um, so I, it would be really great if this could begin to, to be used a little bit more um, widespread. Um, the, from a National Trust for, for Scotland perspective, we've just really finished uh, looking at a port our portfolio review um, and we used some tools that were developed to, to help to, to do that. And when it comes to um, new acquisitions that we are asked to consider, um, we will apply a lens that is much broader than the, the, the cultural values. Um, uh, and, and interestingly, in looking at our portfolio, we have been able to determine the things that um, our portfolio perhaps is not representative of, such as industrial heritage, um, buildings that are more modern in their construction. Um, and so we are beginning to develop a, a, a view to what our portfolio should look like or could look like. And I think we would, we, we've, we've, we would welcome conversations with Historic Environment Scotland as well um, on that. But yes, I, I, I would point the panel to a tool that has been really worked quite hard by the sector and I encourage its, its further use. And I also might want to talk a bit about that. Thank you, convener, um, and thank you, Brian. Um, the tool that Brian's talking about started perhaps in relation to a previous question because it was around prioritisation. It was the initial conversations. Um, but through that, there was um, a, a series of, of values worked through by the sector very extensively over a number of years, um, and it very much considers any site or asset through a lens that looks at a variety of different economic values that, that that could bring, or particularly what investment in that site could could bring. Um, it also looks at social and community values and what, um, what can be brought in that area, environmental perspective, how um, net zero changes can be supported, as well as, of course, um, sort of a, a quarter, it's, it's a circle, there are quadrants, um, uh, a quarter of that is very much all about the cultural value. So those, those are absolutely embedded, embedded within it. Um, very fortunately, and this has not been set up, the tool is launching next week um, with um, uh, public access. Um, it is um, being put out on behalf of the Built Heritage Investment Group, which was one of the last groups relating to our place and time, the previous strategy. Um, it is um, not owned by anybody. It is for the sector. Um, we will be looking after it as a, as a beta tool, so we're um, also looking 
people to give comment and to use it and to tell us how they are using it. And it is very much designed for um, everybody in the broader sense, but people with an interest in this area. But it is designed to be for use by community groups as well as by professional organisations. Um, there's a lot of explanation of language and terms, and it's been it's been made as accessible as we can make it, whilst also being accurate and reflective of the sector, which you can imagine is is a difficult balance. Um, and I think to go to um, uh, Ms. Forbes' question around acquisitions and thinking about what, what Brian was saying, I think that what's important is that um, new sites, obviously old sites to an extent, um, that we're sure that for the future they tell the breadth of the story of Scotland. So I think that when it's about what, what new sites are, it's about what stories are we not telling and what things do we need to bring in to um, our, our portfolio, regardless of where that ownership sits. Um, that really help to express what what matters currently. I think we have quite a good handle on things that have mattered, and I think we have um, quite a quite a, a reflective picture from that perspective. But I, I would say that if we were considering new acquisitions, it's ensuring that breadth of stories is is told. Particularly, I think sort of industrial heritage onwards is 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 where there might be more more gaps. Then we. Keith, was that a supplementary you idea? Yes. <clears throat> it's to say that uh, we've already started hearing some uh, calling inevitably about scarcity of resources in terms of how people can do the things they need to do to look after what we currently have. But the point about new, new sites, potentially, um, I may have missed it, but I didn't hear reference to um, economic uh, regeneration. And I know we can all list various um, sites, but just to mention a couple... In Kennet, near Kincardine, there is the first industrial uh, production site for whisky in Scotland, where it was all taken down to London. In fact, the slip is still there, where it used to go down. It's a roofless building. Um, it has trees growing up through it, so the lottery wouldn't touch it, because they thought it was a magical building. Anyway, that, that site there, and not far from that, there is at the back of the council buildings in Alawa, the graves of Usher uh, Jameson, who was Scottish, not Irish, who uh, worked at the former site. And out with my constituency, thinking about in Edinburgh, you've got the birthplace of Alexander Graham Bell in Canada. I think we've got two visitor centres for Alexander Graham Bell in the States. They've got one. We've got his birthplace and we do uh, nothing with it. So I just wondered whether economic regeneration, a kind of entrepreneurial kind of helicopter view of new sites might produce some of the revenues, maybe for different organisations, that might help with some of the... So is that something you would factor in? Is it in the toolkit? Is it something you would factor in? Um, it, it is, mm. it is with, with, within the toolkit, the sort of what um, sort of economic benefits um, that there can be, as well as social benefits, as well as obviously um, the, the cultural knowledge that, that can come from that. Um, I would perhaps add a note of caution to say that the um, economic regeneration from perhaps smaller sites um, can be less than could be imagined um, in, in terms of visitor numbers through the door, how much it takes to run the building, um, the services relating to that. Is, it, it is a surprisingly difficult balance, I think. So it's one of those things where it can, it can seem like a very good option. Um, but linking back to things that was said previously to the committee around communities and maybe communities taking on sites, um, and, and their desires to perhaps run a small museum or, or things that are absolutely culturally important and relevant to those people in that place, the sustainability of that in, in, in the longer term is an incredibly difficult balance. And I, and I, I very much appreciate the um, desire for, for new sites, but that, that balance is, is one that has to be taken into account for the longer term so that people like us are not coming back to committees in 10, 20 years saying, actually there's a resourcing problem for, for those sites as well. If, if I could just, just follow on on that as well. So um, the National Trust for Scotland, we, we have around about 3,500 volunteers um, who are very loyal to us. Uh, and without our volunteers, we would not be able to operate our sites. Um, so it's an absolute fundamental lifeblood to the organisation. Um, and on, on um, our 
you know, balance books. There are a number of sites that are uh, effectively profitable, but there are, they, they are balanced by the number of sites that are not. Um, so the organisation will constantly operate within a deficit that we're um, safe and, and, and uh, you know, can, can tolerate. So just to reiterate Ailsa's point, um, but, but the, the tool does definitely allow for those conversations on that economic benefit. Um, Neil, I know you talked a bit about skills. You wanted to come in on the skills question. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, on, on the issue of skills, obviously we've heard how important the skills um, shortage is in terms of uh, reaching the goals in the strategy. <coughs> I was struck by the uh, National Trust for Scotland's evidence around the Historic Environment Skills Investment Plan, um, which, which was done in conjunction with SDS, um, which said out of the, um, the targets in the action plan, only 30 per cent of them have been delivered. Now, I know the, um, there's concerns about COVID and a lack of resource. Um, I just wanted to ask, are there any other lessons that can be learned in relation to um, failure to deliver on those, uh, meet those targets? And also, if there is a skill shortage, what work has been done to quantify the number of apprenticeships that are needed, and if there is a funding back home, and funding is the reason why we're not meeting those action points. What is what is the level of funding that is required um, to meet this the skill shortage that there is? So I, I don't know. If it makes sense to go to Skills Development Scotland, but also <laughs> National Trust and, and anyone else that's got the input on that. No, ha happy to come in, and I, I think there's probably two different questions there. So, so I'll start with the first one for the. So when the SIP was created, some of the targets that were sort of put in, and, and it was just before I worked there, so it was about five years ago, they put in right at the end columns some SMART targets. I think when they're referring to the 30%, yeah. it was these very specific SMART goals were put in. What I would say is that the broader actions that were connected with it, there was a lot of work undertook that meets the goals and ambitions of it that didn't necessarily meet some of the SMART targets. And I think some of the very specific actions that didn't happen I think it did come down to funding for certain projects that would have perhaps, they may have, some of them sat with Historic Environment Scotland and others, they may have expected to have had five years ago, but there's been such a change in the landscape and in the funding landscape that that hasn't been able to happen. I think when we're, the development of the current skills investment plan, I think there's been a lot of lessons learned in that time. Um, within Historic Environment Scotland, they've bought brought on dedicated resource that wasn't there before. Um, a lady called Catherine Cartmill, who's there, who's very much leading on this plan. She's got, and got a team there that are working. When we, the actions are set, that will be taken into account. And, and I think there'll be a lot more thought about what actions go in and making sure that when they set smart targets, that the resources are there and the objectives are there to meet it. But there is broader ambitions that they're, work, that they're working towards as well. In terms of the skills, sort of wider skill shortages in the sector, there, there's many sort of different things in play. And I, and I think stone masonry came up, and, and I think that's maybe sort of a, a, good, a good example to use as a case study that, that, that might tie across some of the other areas. Stone masonry is incredibly important to the sector. There, there, there's work in you know, Historic Environment Scotland and others advocate for, for the need to bring more stone masons on. In terms of demand across Scotland, there's absolutely no question we need that skill. We need dual skilled workforce. But sometimes there's a mismatch between the demand across Scotland and at the moment it's the demand employers have to, to bring in those skills. There is only one route to be become a stonemason in Scotland. That's a modern apprenticeship. It's a four year commitment for an employer and it's the in relatively recent years, I think in the last decade or so, it might be back to about 15 years, the demographic of the companies that are supporting the stonemasonry sector has had major shifts. So it's never been huge companies, but there was a lot of medium size and sort of bigger small companies. And those companies took on more apprenticeships um, and, they, and they took them through. The change, the businesses that have supported that sector have changed and it's moved on to even smaller and more, more, and more micro businesses. And they don't necessarily want to commit to taking on that apprentice and taking them through. And that's not a criticism. It's a very, you know, it's a valid business choice. It's a four-year commitment. It's a four-year commitment where you're having to find the wages for someone. But it's not just about finding the wages and being an employer. You're also having to support them through that process. So, you know, a lot, some of apprenticeships are done within, col within college or within centres. 
but so, a lot of it's, it's, it's done. It's, it's a very personal relationship, sort of within a business where they're getting that one-to-one -one training. That is a major commitment, and we have only one pathway. Now that pathway is industry designed. There has been issues around there. At the moment, we have it's 83 apprentices in stonemason across Scotland right now. I got, got the figures before I arrived here. They're, they're going across only three centres. It's one college. It's, we're now down to one college. It's the City of Glasgow College. We do have other centres. Historic Environment Scotland have centres in um, Elgin and Stirling. So, so we have other locations for people to go. But that's not high numbers. It is very, very small numbers. And if we take some of the other construction, the construction framework Stone Masonry sits into, it sits in a construction, and currently in a construction building one, there's about 1,800 other apprentices in the exact same framework not doing Stone Masonry. There is nothing, you know, if the demand was there, there's absolutely nothing to stop them doing Stone Masonry. The demand, first and foremost, you know, that, that is the biggest blocker. And it's that mismatch between what we mean when the demand is a country and what then the demand is from the employers. And then that, because the demand from employers is lower, that has a knock-on effect in, in, the, in the, the skills provision because we then, with low demand, it becomes very difficult for colleges and other centres to have the classrooms there. This is, we need a skilled workforce to train this. It's actually not the cheapest of courses to run because you know, st stone and other equipment it, it isn't cheap. So there's, there's major blockers that all play in because that, because that demand from the employers is lower. The fu and and f the funding, I, I would be adverse to mention, I know certainly if the colleges and others were there, the centres would all argue that they also need more funding, they need greater levels as a, that, than is available. Um, but, they, but they do certainly achieve what is available and a lot of that t tends to be a by-person ratio. So there's so things there. Is that more information you needed? Yeah. No, no, that's helpful, thank <laughs> you. Yeah. I don't know if anyone else has got any comments to make. Um, I'd like to endorse what Elaine has said, um, but when she talks about employer, she is talking about the contractors, the owners of the building firms that are employing the apprentices. But they themselves are looking for work. They need building contracts on which to employ those skills. And one way that can be stimulated is by having grant-aided projects. I remember probably 10 or 15 years ago attending um, a meeting which was chaired by um, Alex Neal in Glasgow. I can't remember the context, but I remember a contractor sitting there and saying, you've stopped grant aiding, this was ref with reference to Historic Scotland, you've stopped grant aiding church work. That was a sure line of work for my labour force. And this is absolutely true. And so while you know, grant aiding is something you, know, you don't want to do, you haven't got money to give out, you actually should really think about it in terms of stimulating the economy and stimulating the demand for skills. Chicken and egg scenarios in terms of what comes first. Um, I, I just want not to stop this line of, of thought, but um, we did have a showcase outside the Parliament of um, the, the apprentices um, doing demonstrating slate work, stonework. Many of my colleagues will have been at that, and it, it, was, it was really interesting. And, uh, and wonderful to meet so many really passionate apprentices in this, these areas. So, um, Lucy, you want to come in? <laughs> yes, thanks. Um, I just wanted to... So, the, the Skills Investment Plan is a very broad plan. There are very, very specific issues around um, stonemasonry, but it is... And, and, and they've been kind of well-addressed, but it's not the only skills area for, for the sector. So, I think it's just important. So, Museums Gallery of Scotland are also um, collaborators in, in the Skills Investment Plan. Um, there are particular areas of skill that are relevant to the historic environment or particular skills that are, are, are relevant to the museum's sector, which we, we, we tackle kind of separately. But there's also the, the really important sort of more generic skills that are, are relevant across, um, across the heritage sector, across the culture sector. So um, one of the things that we... So we have a skills academy. For example, we run a, 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 an apprenticeship in digital marketing. We're looking at developing one around um, leadership. But we also run a programme um, together with BEFS and with Green Space Scotland across the heritage sector, funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, which is about business skills. It's about financial planning, about governance, um, all of those issues that for, for many of the third sector organisations who are looking after our heritage that need those skills to be able to operate sustainably 
And these are some of the things that's also really important that we support those organizations with those skills as well. So the skills investment plan is looking across those wider areas as, uh, as well. And that's been a really successful program. We've had two lots of funding from the Heritage Fund to that, but it is coming to an end. Um, and we very much like to be able to continue what's been a proven um, success program that takes a, a, a individuals from an organization to a whole program and support some of the peer network to be able to do that. So there are some of these other opportunities as well um, that I think it's important that we look across the breadth of skills needs in the sector and not just this, this specific one which does need its own um, solutions. Thanks. Is there anyone else? Caroline? Yeah. Add, um, related um, and to build on the points that Elaine made, the um, challenges or we're, we're seeing particularly for our um, smaller heritage organizations spread right across Scotland is that young people coming out of the pandemic are needing a greater level of support to access uh, the apprenticeships or, or training um, and skills development that, that is available. So we're seeing um, organisations like the Ridge in East Lothian, for example, doing pre-apprenticeship work with young people out of school because there's perhaps now some rethinking needed about how we support young people into whether it's a four-year apprenticeship or some other shape and enable them you know to physically access um, some of these places would it be more appropriate to have local locally based skills development that enables them to be st staying in with the support network of their home environment so i think that there's quite a lot of broader thought that would be beneficial to give to this area to make sure that we're really successful in supporting young people to have a, a long thriving future once they um, get the skills that they that they need. Um, Brian, can yeah. I Just, um, you know, a couple of points. I think that the, the, with relation to the targets and the old SIP, I mean, it really did get launched about a week before we went into lockdown. So uh, I think it, you know, it, it it, it has struggled to gain any momentum af after that. Um, I think that the, the tone of the um, investment plan was very collaborative, which was, which was good, but it, that's quite difficult when you try to engage private owners or other large estate owners um, when we're talking about trying to mainstream that strategy. Um, there was no money available to deliver any of the actions, hence the reason that it, it, was, it was collaborative and it achieved some successes. Um, but maybe that's something that could be looked at. Now, the, 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 the new SIP um, is, is really comprehensively being reviewed now. So I think it's really lifting the carpet under a lot of issues. But I suspect that there will be a, a great deal of action out of that, that I think if we try to mainstream a little bit, um, it might be more beneficial to put some investment behind that, and you might attract a much wider audience to helping to support some of the actions. Anyone? Elaine, did you want to come in here? Uh, yeah, and again, it's maybe, I'm very conscious I'm answering a lot around um, the construction sides. I apologise for, for the other sides, but in, in terms of sort of mainstreaming, we're, we're, we're doing some work in uh, with the reviewing of the current, some of the current apprenticeships, so that some that are relevant to the sector, there's a carpentry and joinery apprenticeship review that's ongoing at present, and there's one on interior building fit out that crosses over into some subjects like um, sort of traditional plastering and um, we have had the sort of discussions on how best to incorporate and include it in and it is it's very much a balancing act on on how you have the time to do that and include because we're not just training um, plasterers or joiners for historic environment we're, we're training them to be ready to go out to any part of the economy so it's how we fit that within the sort of the space within existing teaching space it's how we do that in a way that can work so but we have had those conversations we have had the representatives from the um, historic environment as part of those conversations and we're actively working and looking at how best to place it and it will be there it will be included but again it might be more that it becomes part of a knowledge base or it becomes part of the learning rather than part of the core qualification but it, but it will be there and, I, and it the, the design questions back to the sector on what next and when people are actually working in the sector is there additional qualifications or additional requirements that could be looked for over and above but there's absolutely been been worked on to to look at how we we embed it in, in the part that we do okay yep Alexander, yeah, i mean you know you've identified that there is a skill shortage uh, but but we also have a wealth of talent in volunteers and in individuals who have got 
you know, I think of, for example, men's sheds, where they're they are, they are bringing together individuals across a, a wide range of, of, of sector uh, that have skills that they've been in the past, that they're passing on to other people who come and join. How have you tapped into the, the third sector uh, and the volunteering sector to see what they can add to uh, the skill base that you have and, and also hand over that skill because these individuals may have stopped their working life uh, environment, uh, but they still have that skill and base that they can hand on to the next generation uh, to support and, and come along and do things for many of your organisations. Um, I, th I think that particular question is probably one that some of the organisations that, that work directly within the historic sector could answer a lot better than me. I, 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 don't, I don't doubt that that is, is a resource that they, they should have looked at and, and will have had have, have the opportunities to connect over with. I think from our side, it's we're very much focused on the skills that are relating into specific occupations and qualifications. So for in my job, it goes back to this, this, the skills to become a qualified carpet and joiner or a qualified bricklayer, qualified electrician. It, 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 it's back to that occupation. When we're looking at those skills and how best to get these skills, we do go out into industry to, to get um, feedback. We, we do consult widely. We work really closely with industry leaderships, but we also make sure that we go right back and we speak with our um, apprentice, apprentices that are currently going through the system or just out the other end. We talk with employers. So, so, so my angle is, is slightly different from that angle. But there's... Thank you. Neil, are you? Yeah, We're obviously in a climate emergency, and you know you've already focused some of your comments on that. I'm looking at the strategy here. You know, the first priority is delivering that transition to net zero, and it's primarily focusing on, I guess, that historic environment asset. Um, but I'm wondering to what extent, you, you know, you think there's enough, enough sort of. Um, embedding of the historic environment sector in other government strategies that are pushing towards net zero. And I was particularly struck by AHSS's submission to the committee where you talk a lot about, you know, the pre-1919 buildings in Scotland. I think many of us, including myself, live in those buildings, recognise some of the some of the challenges, but some of the kind of design features of those buildings are important as well. Um, so I was interested in what your thoughts are on that on that particular issue around housing, around retrofitting, around skills development, and whether the historic environment sector can really be a driver um, for that wider transition within housing. And then just sort of related to that, about whether with climate policy more generally you see some tensions. So, you know, Caroline would visit Scotland. You know, if the objective here is to grow tourism in Scotland, does that come with aviation? If it does, it, then that obviously takes us backwards in terms of climate change. And just about the, also the role of historic environment, you know, in terms of designations, does that create uh, a break on renewable energy development, whether that's wind farms, whether that's um, conservation areas, you know, restricting the rollout of embedded renewables such as solar panels and everything else. So, yeah, um, tensions, but also opportunities as well, and whether the sector can be a real driver in terms of uh, skills and, um, and, uh, and, and progress. Brian, do you want to um, Yeah, uh, the, the net zero um, topics is, uh, you know, I think it's absolutely fundamental to how we look at our built estate. Um, a lot of our built estate, and I'm not speaking just about the National Trust for Scotland's estate, but, um, you know, when you go out into the high streets, um, you, you know, you're, you're, you're in amongst the historic environment. Um, a lot of that has been tinkered with in the past, um, and that has um, often done with materials that were done with the best of intentions back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, but actually are deleterious to the, the way that the fabric operates at the minute. Um, so, you know, the introductions of cement renders on gable walls and things like that, you probably know that topic. Um, those things, when you look to um, retrofit a building, i.e. upgrade its energy, if you do not take a fabric-first approach to that, then um, you, you, you're almost wasting your money because the building has to operate within an equilibrium where it, uh, it allows transition of moisture 
um, and um, allows for better thermal performance of the fabric. I think the scale of that across our high streets and individual estates is really substantial. So I think there is a real opportunity for the, the making sure that our fabric is fit for purpose first, and then uh, you know you will get effective retrofit after that. So I think. To, to answer your point, yes, I think that the historic environment strategy can really lead on, on those particular topics. Good reflection, and I'll, I'll be aiming to chip away at the cement-based render on the side of my house <laughs> over a number of years. Um, but, but, but I suppose the question is, what, what, do, do you think that's reflected enough in government strategy then? So we've got a heat and building strategy coming. You know, we talked about skills earlier on. Where, you know, we've got a historic environment strategy but it's very much focused on historic environment. We know kind of what, what needs to happen. Should, should your sector not be kind of embedded into other strategies? Thank you very much for the question. Um, this is an area that as an organisation we work in extensively. Um, I agree wholeheartedly that the historic environment is not embedded well enough across other strategies. Um, we work a lot with the team within Heaton Buildings um, and within, my understanding is, uh, I'll say the last six months, I'm a little, um, there is now a new team within that for historic and listed buildings because there is finally, and I, I, I really do want to stress this point, finally an understanding that this is an awful lot of our existing environment. It is an awful lot of our housing, as is um, part of the Infrastructure Commission's um, report. Housing was seen as part of our infrastructure and then gets sort of gently pushed to the side while we think about other things. Um, because these buildings are not difficult. They are just different and they have to be considered differently. Um, and it's fantastic that there is now some, some energy um, pun unintended, um, within that area because there are specificities that need to be considered and that does make things trickier because it isn't as easy as, well, you just do this because there are different typologies, different types. Um, I would say that there is also work um, going on around tenements and tenement maintenance. Um, the the cross-party group um, on, on, on tenemental maintenance is, is one which has worked very hard in this area. There is ongoing work, but it has been... Um, incredibly slow, not just due to COVID, but obviously where priorities sit um, across portfolios, I think, has been, has been difficult. And when it comes to meeting net zero, the historic environment is not appreciated for its embedded carbon and its already existing value. And that's a continual challenge. There is work ongoing across the sector and beyond on how that is measured. But I would say that we can spend a lot of time trying to unpick the exact measurements rather than knowing that these structures are stone built. They do have inherent value, both from a carbon perspective and obviously from a social and cultural perspective. Um, and that isn't fully represented across a range of policies, but I would say particularly net zero and heat and buildings is an area where we're obviously going to see significant change for the future. Um, as, a, as a final point, um, I would say that there's a uh, significant range of documents produced by Historic Environment Scotland around managing change, whether that be in relation to conservation areas, whether that be in relation um, to, to retrofit or many other things. And I would say that over recent years, those documents have taken great pains to talk about what is possible. And it isn't that designation is a stop. It's, it's just a case of um, more thought, consideration and detail may go into it. But it's, it, it's not about what isn't possible. It should very much be about what is. Thank you. Lucy, and then I'll come to Jocelyn. Aline, did you want to reckon as well? Yeah. Thank you. Um, just as a related point, you asked about the opportunities, um, and I think that um, it's it was slightly beyond, in a sense, what, what's, what's here is the, the outcomes for this strategy. But I think we know that climate change requires culture change um, in terms of our behaviours, and I think that the buildings that are in the public realm and those that are within you know, the, the, the charitable sector as well are as an opportunity um, to act as exemplars that are there to um, engage the public with the stories. They're trusted institutions, museums and galleries are trusted institutions. We work with them a lot in terms of communicating the possibility, acting as demonstrators and talking to people about even the small actions that people can take. So I think the possibility of using our historic environment assets and estate to, to, to try and support the wider transition for the, for the 
that you know, but for the private sector, I think is, is shouldn't be overlooked as the importance of that. So it's just an mm -hmm. opportunity identified. Okay, Jocelyn. Um, I just wanted to wave this book around um, and to commend to you all the work that Historic Environment Scotland has done. Uh, this is their guide to energy retrofit of traditional buildings, and I think it should be required reading. Um, because it does explain what is possible. Thank you. Aileen? I, I, what I would say is some of the right conversations are, are now definitely happening around that subject. Um, there was a energy efficiency... There was an energy efficiency skills matrix created that did put a um, reference to a qualification at Historic Environment Scotland created on traditional buildings. Um, and sort of highlighted the importance of contractors who already mainly have good baseline skills there, but there is a short amount of upskilling needed just to make sure they focus on the right area. The conversations are also happening with national construction partners. I think there's probably a greater awareness now because of the retrofit agenda than there, there ever has been before on the importance of Fabric First, but also on the importance of it being suitable measures and making sure that they have the right skills within that workforce to make the choices. And I know there's been some work getting done on building database at, at different places. I, I, again, um, other people can pick up more detail on that, but they're, they're definitely the right conversations are happening. But it's how that then gets translated is, is another question. Okay. Sorry, Caroline, did you want in? Yeah. Um, I suppose I've got a related point, but not not precisely answering your, your question there, but um, some work that we've been doing with the natural heritage sector is very much tied back to our historic built environment. Um, we've been developing a green finance model with Nature Scott, um, which is innovative um, ways of supporting new um, natural adaptation, uh, natural capital programs. And interestingly, quite a few of those urban ones look at then go, looking at, for example, rivers running through towns, the cost of flooding, how that's managed. It's, it's looking back at how they were historically managed and reinstating that. And there are opportunities around a number of historic buildings and the estates around those to take advantage of green finance more in the future. So I think that um, when we talk about mainstreaming, I think thinking about what's going on in the natural environment world and how that can be applied to the physical built environment estate. You know, yes, we're, we're focusing very much on buildings today, but they sit in a place and that place has a role in um, impacting carbon capture, but also biodiversity growth. Of course, they're the two different sides of the, the crisis there. And so we should be trying to think in a holistic way what the built environment can bring on those fronts. Um, sorry, Mark. Oh, Caroline, sorry, um, online. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Sorry. Um, just to come back to Mark around the comments around tourism in particular. So from an aviation perspective, obviously, aviation is a is a significant um, emitter of carbon. Um, and we recognise that uh, the challenge we have is the UK being an island. So there is a balance around um, the requirement for our, our visitors to get to us um, and they will do that by air but we're also there to promote other options as well we do also focus on the uk as a key market for us um, and any of those overland opportunities that people can travel i think for us the focus where we um, feel we can make the biggest difference at the moment is around the quality and the impact that people have whilst they're here so that is around um, traveling overland longer stays so if you are traveling from overseas and you're flying in you know how can you make sure that you make the most of your your trip whilst you're here um, coming back to the historic environment um, and really just to highlight that we're aware that um, there are a number of attractions that are struggling with the challenges of um, energy costs due to the the fabric of the building so the example that um, I'm aware of within my region is uh, Discovery Point for example which um, is a, a key asset in terms of um, our RRS discovery um, however the fabric of the building the actual visitor attraction um, is very poor because it was built I think in the 1980s when uh, with low insulation so they have a real challenge in terms of upgrading their um, uh, their fabric of their building in order to continue to provide 
the interpretation for for the historic um, asset that they have, which is which is the boat. From Visit Scotland's perspective, I suppose I really just wanted to highlight the work that we're doing um, in a couple of areas. One is around um, Destination Net Zero, which um, is a programme that we're working on with the um, three enterprise agencies and Scottish Government to try and provide, um, to, uh, to look at the tourism industry um, as a whole and how we can start to reduce um, or move the, that transition towards net zero, both as um, an industry, but also what advice can we provide to businesses? Um, and some of that is around climate action planning. Um, we're working with destination organisations to help them to understand what they can do in destination as well. So there's a huge range of activity that's going on, and that feeds into the, the historic environment. And I think in terms of the strategy that shows where those interlinkages are between um, the transition to net zero within the um, our place, our future strategy, but also how that is interlinked with um, the national strategy for economic transformation or the other um, plans. So there is real alignment there. And I think it helps to focus our attentions on things such as climate change and the transition to net zero. Okay. Thank you, Keith. Yeah, i just come back to uh, the previous question we've asked it in a different way. I think yesterday's autumn statement is being read now, and uh, one of the implications is a, a real further crunch on public uh, services, uh, especially 27-28. So, given the pressures that people are talking about, it's about how rigorously people are examining other options. I understand the point that was made by Ailsa about, um, you know, if you have a uh, attraction that you open, it can be long-term cost, and it might not quite attract the, the, the numbers that you want. Well, in relation to the Alexander Graham Bell's birthplace around the corner, you've just seen established the Johnny Walker uh, Visitor Centre, which is doing great guns, and that's taken over the entire House of Fraser building. So I think it, it's possible, but it's whether we properly are exploiting, if that's the right word, some of the assets that we have. And there's something in our papers called intangible cultural heritage. I'm not sure if this relates to it, but two other quick examples. One, in Stirling, the Smith Art Gallery Museum discovered they had the world's oldest football. Um, instead of keeping it on a dusty shelf, they brought it out. They had um, international satellite uh, uh, news feeds from around the world came outside the Smith. They then went to Hamburg for the World Cup, and it came on, even though Scotland weren't there. It came on at the start. Huge. Um, Huge influence, or we took over William Wallace's sword over to New York and had huge response for that. The Wallace Monument visitor figures went through the roof. So it's whether we're rigorously examining the other opportunities. Uh, and I think muse it's maybe particularly in museums, although we had a, 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 we had a evidence session with some uh, library representatives and I mentioned the fact that the Central Library in Edinburgh, they're sitting next to where all the witches were executed and Greyfriars Bobby, and you could try and exploit that. So given how the pressure we see on public services, are people satisfied that we are sufficiently and rigorously looking at other alternatives to generate some of the funds to allow the, the other things we want to do? Because my fear is that the public um, resources just won't be there to the same extent in future. Maybe Lucy, first of all. If um, could I maybe just put a supplementary mm -hmm. onto that before we bring people in to answer it, Keith? And, um, obviously, our predecessor committee had tourism as part of it. Um, we don't now, but, but we do have made major events under the Cabinet Secretary and also um, the diaspora strategy of the Scottish Government, which has been talked about, that reach. And um, I just wondered if we could also have a little bit about how, how people are, are looking to that strategy, although this is... is session is about the, the, the historic environment strategy, but how, how those things are being linked up. Um, uh, so if I go to Lucy first. Yeah, there's a lot in there. And I think, I mean, I think, yes, I think organisations have been really creative, um, certainly from museums and galleries perspective, but beyond, well, beyond that of, of thinking really creatively and innovatively over, over the you know, years of, of different ways to unlock um, wider audiences. I think there's also about the storytelling that you can do, and that's a brilliant example from the Smith and, and the football of, of what are the stories that there are in our collection that enable us to, to engage audiences in different ways. And that's absolutely core to the mission of, of museums and, and the energy they have. Um, I would say that that, that is still um, 
a resource question at the end of the day because actually the, 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 the looking after your building and, the, and the, the displays that you have at the moment is is a challenge in itself so animating those displays and changing them and updating them is absolutely something we need to do because you need to keep refreshing that to tell new stories to, as visitor expectations change as our expectations change around um, the what is being represented in our museums and so on but i think that creativity of looking for those those um ideas of what might engage is definitely is there's a lot of um, passion around that it was a really interesting mention you made of the intangible cultural heritage side of things so these are the the, the, the culture the traditions the craft skills the, the language and all of the things that, go, you know, that aren't actually the museum object but they're the things that bring that to life and the the living practice and and um, so on that goes on around um those objects and tells those stories and, and keeps that alive so that we're, there's a lot of um new i'm really excited to say new discussions around intangible cultural heritage which is um we're hoping that we, we hear that there's an intention coming or new activity around the, the the unesco convention around intangible cultural heritage um so um museums gallery scotland have been very active in this space and we're the first accredited um advisor to unesco in scotland or indeed in the uk um on intangible cultural heritage so that is an exciting part of where we can bring the current practice and activity and living tradition and, and so on together to create those new activities, new stories and, and bring things to life again in, in new ways and, and bring in new audiences. So I think there are those opportunities there. I think museums are very good at looking at that. I think the storytelling aspect's really um, a vibrant opportunity. I think that the Year of Stories was a really good example of that. Um, where a lot of community organisations engaged uh, through the Year of Stories Communities Fund, as well as the, the larger events that were run with support from, from Scottish Government, from the National Lottery Heritage Fund and Museums Gallery of Scotland, to um, invite communities to tell new stories uh, and um, stories that had been lesser told stories about their communities and their places. And that had a, a huge impact for actually quite small levels of investment. So those were really small grants in communities and what communities could do to bring those things to life. So there is a, a huge amount of appetite for that. Um, some of that doesn't take large amounts of resource to be able to support that volunteer effort that can do that. So um, I think that was a, a really strong example. The evaluation for that is really powerful from, from the year of stories and the impact that that had. So yes, it's a, it's a good seam that we should continue to tap and to support. Caroline, so we'll go to Caroline in the room first and then online. Thanks. Um, thank you. Um, at the National Lottery Heritage Fund, one of the requirements for the projects that we support is that they're financially viable, not just during the delivery phase, but we spend a lot of time looking at the longer term sustainability um, of the projects that come to us. So we've seen some really interesting examples of that entrepreneurship that you touched on earlier. So one that springs to mind, and I think, Neil, I'm taking you around tomorrow, um, Paisley Museum, um, where they've looked at their collection, their textile heritage collection, which has got the most beautiful collection of pattern books and have worked with the fashion industry to both monetize that in some instances very restricted and carefully curated instances but also look at how the how those relationships that are built can benefit local art students um, and um, artists to help them develop connections and um, knowledge of of the fashion industry and so that kind of thinking is, is something that museums have got to do perhaps a bit more of in terms of thinking about what's um, sitting in their collections, but they need the support to do that. And that's where working collaboratively with, say, um, Scottish Enterprise, Visit Scotland and others to exploit um, and, and to bring the expertise in to enable that to be done well and appropriately is, is critical. Um, I also you to touch on those small community um, heritage um, monuments, for example, that maybe don't immediately illustrate that financial viability but I think we've got some great examples like Sky Eco Museum where you have a landscape with a number of interesting assets and they've been strung together in a trail which then draws visitors encourages them to dwell for a greater amount of time learning about the local the locally interesting and intriguing stories that are there but in but by collating them you've made enough of an interest for a tourist to make that journey and do that do that route and I think there's potential um, when we're looking at things like Scotland's rural churches, um, pilgrimage, tourism, spiritual well-being um, is an area that I think there's potential to, to look at in, in greater detail. So there are some really great examples of that entrepreneurial creativity within the built environment sector. Um, and it's just making sure that the support is there to make sure that it's done well and done appropriately. Um, yeah. Caroline? 
Thank you. Um, yes, for me, this is around telling the story and looking for opportunities to tell the story well. And I think um, we might have a historic building, um, but there are numerous stories that we can tell. And I think um, often it's around the, the people who run the building, but also um, for the likes of us at Visit Scotland, we're always looking for you know those hooks such as the oldest football, you know, that helped to, to put Scotland or to put a place or to put a community on the map. And some examples um, are the around the themed years and how the themed years give us that opportunity to, to, to get everybody talking about the same subject, whether that's stories, whether it's uh, coast and waters, whether it's um, history and heritage. So they, they are a real um, opportunity for us to, to, to really shine a light on the, the, the historic environment, if, um, for example. Um, the other opportunity is around people and using our people and often our historic people. So um, Andrew Carnegie and Dunfermline, for example, is a really um, unique opportunity to use the fact that he was born and grew up in Dunfermline with the links across to the diaspora in America. Um, and that's certainly something particularly looking at Forbes and the link across to Pittsburgh. So there are all those opportunities that we can make both from a cultural um, perspective, but also from our perspective for encouraging people to come and visit. And Burns is another uh, excellent example there. Um, a couple of other things are around anniversaries and how we can use anniversaries to tell the story and to refocus on a particular building or a particular event. Declaration of our growth being one, um, which is a, an intangible a, a, a piece of uh, paper, but actually gave us an opportunity to to look at um, our growth Abbey again, to look at the place to to encourage people to go and visit that part of Angus. So again, using those as a as a as a as a shape, and then finally, um, I wanted to mention screen tourism and the opportunity that um, the using place places in Scotland um, as locations, Outlander being perhaps the obvious one um, that not only encourages people to come and visit Scotland and places, but simply from the screen industry perspective is actually rejuvenating and providing an income, which is enabling some of our um, built heritage to continue to be used and to be, continue to be valued. So there, it's an excellent question. There are numerous ways in which um, we can retell the stories of our built um, and intangible heritage to help remind people just of the sort of the quality and the depth of stories that we've got here in Scotland um, and also the value of them. Um, so, yeah, just to add in some examples there, um, which I hope are helpful. Okay. So another one of these situations where the screen industry is a real success in Scotland at the moment. But again, it, uh, they need carpenters and they need builders and they need the electricians. So uh, it all starts to squeeze on the sector. Kate, you wanted to give in a go. Thanks very much. I just wanted to pick up on some of the comments that Caroline had made around telling stories and actually the comments that Lucy had made about intangible cultural uh, heritage, because I've long campaigned for, um, for Gaelic to be recognised as an intangible cultural heritage by UNESCO. And so I wanted to ask what role language has and, and Gaelic has in particular. Uh, around the stories that we tell. Um, and I'm, I often get very frustrated about sort of more of a tokenistic approach where it's just a tick box uh, versus uh, an approach that sees Gaelic really embedded in the stories and how you tell the stories. And I suppose that's another skill, therefore, that you need to develop as part of your teams. Um, in terms of, of, of Gaelic speakers. So I was just curious as to where you think an intangible asset like language sits alongside the stories you tell about uh, buildings. Caroline, yes. <laughs> um, should I come in on that one? Um, so we're in the process of developing the Gaelic tourism strategy. Um, which I understand is due to be launched um, shortly. Um, and I hope that that provides an indication of the commitment to um, ensuring that Gaelic and tourism is um, are, are joined together. Um, uh, I've just been working in Glasgow with the, um, the Glasgow Tourism Strategy. And again, we've had a conversation around how Gaelic can be um, woven into that around things like 
Celtic Connections, for example, you know, a huge number of Gaelic speakers in, in the city. Um, I stay over on the East Coast in Fife um, and speaking there with the amount of Gaelic work that's going on there, looking at the, the links between place names um, and Gaelic. So I think um, there are opportunities to um, to make sure that Gaelic is embedded within our culture, which it is, um, and to make more of that. We are seeing um, new products coming forwards from a visitor perspective in terms of people are looking from Caroline. Can you hear us, Caroline? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, um, I'm sorry, Caroline, we've, we've probably lost you for the, the remainder of the, the time, uh, but um, if you want to feed back in writing to, to, to Ms Forbes and the committee, wider committee, that would be really helpful. Does anyone else want to come in on that area? Lucy? So, yeah, I think um, it's just there's some really interesting practice in museums now about, um, and those who are um, able to, to, to do their redisplays about putting Gaelic first mm. in terms of where they are providing um, dual um, uh, language interpretation. I think it's part of um, recognising the individual character of any place, so Gaelic, Scots, about using, bringing in the things that add colour in that storytelling and that represent the, 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 those unique places, which I think is increasingly an, an appetite for from visitors to, to really understand that all places are different and that identity is, is often um, captured in a museum and gallery or, as, or, or other um, historic sites and, and to be able to sort of... Um, recognise the special nature of that. So we are promoting it as far as we can. Again, it, it, the, there are some resource questions. There's a really interesting project in... Um, uh, we funded for a number of the Highland museums to get together to have a joint Gaelic development officer, so it might not be possible for any one organisation to be able to afford to do that if you're a small museum, but by coming together, they've appointed one Gaelic development officer that's supporting a number of different museums around a regional forum. So I think that's quite a useful model as well, where we can look at partnership approaches to, to sharing the resource to be able to promote that kind of activity, and then for that to be a demonstrator for, to inspire others to do that kind of thing. Are there any questions from... Colleagues, Alexander. Yeah. You've all talked about today the ambitions of the strategy, and, and I think that's very clear uh, that there are ambitions for each and every one of you in your, in your sector. Uh, but these will only be realised if we have the actions and the framework and the delivery uh, that is appropriate to find that. We've already identified just discussions and, your, and the information you've given us and you've written as submissions that we have a skill shortage. We have funding support issues and we have investment that's required. So I suppose it all comes down to how each of your organisations are, are planning for the sort of medium and long term financial support and the investment that you have for the future. Because the only way that these ambitions will be achieved is if we can sort of square that circle. Uh, and, you know, you all want to thrive and survive. Uh, but it, it would fear, you know, that we are at a crossroads. Many of your organisations are, are, are at that stage where, where the next step is. It could be uh, a challenge. We already know there are challenges out there, but it could be a bigger challenge depending on where you take your organisation and where you want your organisation to be. So, as I say, for me, it's about your, your medium and long-term financial support and investment and where and what you need to ensure that you do thrive and survive from the strategy we've set you. Thank you. I don't know who wants to kick off that first. Look, you got tails. Thank you very much. It's a challenge for any organisation. We're a very small organisation. Um, we're between three and four FTE. Um, we support a wide number of members across the sector. Um, but we are reliant currently on funding from Historic Environment Scotland. Um, that's around 90-92% um, of our funding, so extremely reliant. Um, we're currently in a three-year uh, funding cycle. Um, prior to that, it was individually year-on-year. -year. So, um, as with many organisations across the sector, we are dependent on how larger agencies and NDPBs are funded. Um, and I will not go into the fine detail because I appreciate that you have examined the culture budget recently. Um, but those challenges, I think, apply 
to ourselves and to a number of other organisations. But we also are very keen to look to the future. Um, we are 20 years old as an organisation this year, um, and we have been funded through Historic Environment Scotland or Historic Scotland previously um, for that entire time. But we are not complacent around that. And recently we've received funding from the National Australian Heritage Fund to examine our own operating model, to look at new ideas, to look at um, the innovation that, 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 that you were speaking of, to see what is possible for us within the sector. But as a third sector intermediary, um, a, a lot like funding maintenance, it's, it's, it's not that sexy. There aren't that many people who fund third sector intermediaries because our delivery is for and with the sector rather than for and with individuals or communities, which is, that, 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 that is our role, but it does, um, it, it does make challenges. But yes, we very keenly plan for the future as an organisation, but I would say that um, the long-term funding cycles across, um, across culture is, is something that we would be very keen to see as an organisation because we understand quite keenly where those benefits would be felt. Brian? Um, is there anyone else? Yeah. Brian? Brian? Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so um, from a National Trust perspective, I suppose what we ultimately look at is the growth of our membership. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the, the, our, our members help sustain the organisation and within our 10-year strategy, we've got targets to, to achieve that. Um, so, in order to do that, that means that we've got to continually be relevant to the audiences and grow new audiences as well, and that's absolutely critical within our um, new tenure strategy. And that relates to the points that were being made about storytelling and, and really working hard at trying to look at our assets in different ways so that we can tell stories that are relevant for a whole range of population and then from there hopefully engage them in conversations on the benefits of membership. Um, so that's really one of the bedrocks to, to our, our growth strategy. Um, we, when it comes to um, the, you know, we, we have a conservation deficit on the estate and we also have a need to invest in the estate. So um, we would be looking to approach a whole variety of different grant providers for that. Um, we have a, a um, fundraising department that work incredibly hard both here and overseas um, to uh, try to tap into all sources of, of funding. And again, it's about what um, stories we can say um, through the, our actions that might you know, engage new audiences that may be prepared to, to give. Um, but I suppose one of the key things that remains is just looking after the built estate and maintaining that in a good condition um, and improving our cyclical maintenance that relates to the challenges that we are facing with regard to climate change. Um, and that is a very real financial challenge, I think, for the organisation and for, for, um, for this, you know, from a skills perspective as well. So, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's an area that we, we work really quite hard on. Lucy. Thank you, Lucy. Yeah, so, I mean, as, as Elsa says, the, the Committee has looked, looked at this long and hard, but we're, we're, although we're the national development body for the museums and gallery sector, and uh, we are lead the body for a, a seven-year strategy we've just launched, we are in a one-year funding cycle. So we don't yet know what our budget will be for next year. So that, that is an enormous challenge, which I think as, you know, has been sort of explored before. But, so we're an organisation of about 40 people, but there's almost no... No one in there that, that we've got more than one person working on that. So the, the responsibilities we've had, and I've been with the organisation for just a bit more than four years, we, there's more and more we, we're asked to do and that we want to do. We're taking on responsibility to support the sector in fair work, to support the sector in, in a move towards net zero. Um, so that it feels like the, the ask of us and the need from a sector that's very fragile from us is, is increasing. Um, while we're, we're, we're kind of struggling to, to, to manage to do all of that. But the ambition is there, the, the, the importance of things like working in partnership and collaborating to be as smart as we possibly can with those resources. Um, uh, th there's a lot of effort that goes into that, and a lot of commitment to that, but one-year funding cycles are a real challenge. Kathleen, did you want to come back in here? Yeah, I was just going to um, come in as a funder of Heritage, I suppose, so investment is our bread and butter, that's why we're here. Um, our funding, of course, has to be additional to government. That's enshrined in the Lotteries Act. Um, and so we can provide project funding for things above and beyond core, core government uh, responsibilities. 
Um, but we have tried, uh, in recognition of the, the issues flagged today, to lay out a much longer term strategy this time. So for the first time ever, we've just launched a 10 year strategy, which we hope the clarity of our strategic objectives over that time will enable partners to see how they can hook into that funding and access it. And I think the pandemic did require us all to work much more collaboratively and that has stayed and we are working to collaborate as much as we can, to work as efficiently as we can. And it's, it's, it's challenging to maintain that, but it's very, very important that we do. And in my written evidence, I've cited a couple of examples where by working with, for example, Historic Environment Scotland to um, align the timing of our funding, we were able to make sure that we channeled significantly greater resource into particular priority areas. Um, and it would be good to see that moving forward. I think that the staffing that Historic Environment Scotland is bringing to the strategy would, will enable that to happen uh, in a way that hasn't before. I'm optimistic around that. Um, but there's no getting away for, for us as a funder who can put forward, say, a five-year package that the annualised funding for the sector makes it very, very difficult for them to take advantage of the investment that we want to put in um, and, and isn't in some ways a constraint on, on the sector being as ambitious as it could be and accessing the other pots of funding that are out there. So I think um, for us that would make a, a real tangible difference if there was some way of um, dealing with that, the, the, the short duration of the commitment there. Thank you. Um, Caroline, I think your sound might be working again if you want to pick up on the points from earlier. Um, it, it's it's okay, thank you. It does seem to be working, but um, we can put something to the committee in the interest of time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I bring in Donald again, please? <laughs> thank you. Um, it's, it's a rather specific question about community asset transfer, uh, and it picks up, Caroline, I think, on some things you've already said and what you say in your submission. But this strategy, Our Past, Our Future, estimates that around one-third of all community asset transfers since 2015 have involved a heritage asset, which you know, I was both pleased but surprised to, to read. That seems very high. Um, and in your submission, in the National Lottery Heritage Fund submission, I think you say uh, and make the point about support for longer term, support for community asset transfer beyond simply acquiring it and transferring it to the community. Um, this committee actually had very similar evidence during our culture in the communities uh, inquiry. Uh, we heard from Volunteers Scotland who said that you know, some people in communities often feel obliged to take on an, a, a heritage asset um, for fear of it being lost to the community. And there are then considerable challenges about maintenance, etc. So I just wondered if you wanted to expand on that further, given the importance. It is so impressive, the appetite that communities have to take on um, assets, and I think really shows the the passion and the emotional connection they have to um, their historic places. But sometimes those, those community groups can be unaware of the challenges, the financial burdens and the expertise needed to manage them in a long-term way. So while challenging, it's more straightforward to pull together funding for the capital works, but the longer term management, maintenance, financial management can be a real, um, difficulty which I think it would be helpful for us to think about more um, at those early stages and make sure that there are either well both skills and longer term resourcing in place to enable that to happen and I think many of these asset transfers you know happen in places where there isn't easy access to um, the financial skills the um, architectural skills needed to maintain the assets so in central about they're quite spoiled. There are, I'm not saying there, are, there, are, um, there aren't challenges, but there are more architects, there's more, there's more volunteering available, whereas often in more remote rural areas, people are volunteering on a whole host of different um, organisations, including the asset transfer, and the specific built environment skills you need to maintain a historic asset are few and far between anyway. Uh, let's, we've just been talking about all the skills that are needed um, in terms of maintaining the structure, but also knowing what to do about that. So I do think there's a, a cash issue, but perhaps also a skills issue, whether there could be a skills bank or centres of excellence where um, community asset transfer communities could dip into 
pull out the knowledge they need at the times they need it. There's something just about giving a longer term safety net to make sure they really are successful because the impacts they have, I mean, the reason they've been community asset transfers is because they're so important, they really perform a function for those communities. And we need to make sure that that functionality and that activity can be maintained, that we don't just have an empty shell that's, that's not actually delivering all the benefits the communities want to see. So, yes, don't get me started on this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I bring in uh, Mark? <laughs> Sorry, I forgot what it was going um, to Yes, unless there are others want to answer that question, because I thought it was a good question. Oh. It's raised quite an interesting okay, area. Okay, um, Jocelyn, time. I'll come back to Brian there as well. Well, well I, I just wanted to talk about the future proofing, and it, it is a sense, um, building on what Caroline mm. has just said, um, I'm a trustee of Historic Churches Scotland, which used to be the Scottish Redundant Churches Trust. And at the moment, we um, are responsible for eight churches. And we do regard it as a success story that we have um, re repaired with uh, grant aid several of our churches. Um, and they are used for different things. And we have a major project underway at um, St. Margaret's um, formerly Episcopal Church in Braemar, which um, was linked recently to a St. Margaret's visit, a pilgrimage visit by the Hungarians. Um, but the problem we have is that each church has a friends organization, but you have to keep refreshing the friends organization. Um, and it's where those skills come from, where it's the, the, commit, the time commitment of the locals um, and it, it tends to fall on one or two whereas you hope it will fall on the many the most recent church we've taken on um, in Orkney um, does have an active skill active friends organization which is the next generation down and they're immensely enthusiastic and they're raising money but it's how how we mobilize the next generations um, to bring both their governance skills, their time commitments, their fabric knowledge to the benefit of, in this instance, churches, but it could be any um, community asset. As, as soon as you started talking about the volunteers, I, I reflected on our visit to Orkney, um, where, where, where the, the message was that everybody wore, wore 10 hats in Orkney and there was kind of like volunteer fatigue uh, and capacity and uh, issues and in terms because it, it tended to fall on the same people over and over again. So uh, bring Brian in. Yeah, just, just to reiterate some of the points raised there, um, we're often approached by uh, different organisations just to give maybe advice on running an asset that might be sitting in the community. But the range of skills required to do that, you know, you have um, skills required for marketing, for fundraising, for compliance, for daily operation, for long-term maintenance. Um, they're not easy to hand, particularly in rural environments. Um, and I, I point you to an organisation such as the Heritage Trust Network, which tries to connect communities to um, a expertise uh, and communities that may want to try to, um, you know, take a bit more ownership of a redundant building. So, so sort of n um, networking organisations like that are very, very positive. I think the, wh when it comes to, so say if there is a, 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 an asset that's potentially of interest to a community but requires investment or adaption, um, often the building preservation trusts that exist around Scotland um, are very useful organisations that come into there as well. But they're quite a fragile resource at the minute. They tend to live through limited Historic Environment Scotland funding on a year-on-year -year cycle and tend to be a little bit fragile as well. So there's probably something about just trying to make these areas more, more robust. Thank you. Yeah. Mark, do you want to come in? With... I think uh, I'll have to be... Very specific question. It was just about World Heritage Site designations. Um, you know, we obviously have a range of World Heritage Sites in Scotland at the moment, but I was interested in the potential for for further designations and if there are any reflections on that. I know that St Andrews has been discussed and mentioned in, in the past, but there, may, there might be other candidates. Okay. Um, Caroline, do you want to come on from online on that one? 
Um, I'm happy to. Um, I'm not aware in terms of the, or I'm not able to comment specifically on, on new sites that are coming forwards. Um, however, I, I, the, the one opportunity I would use is to talk about the UNESCO Heritage Trail that Visit Scotland developed with UNESCO and many other partners. Um, Scotland is unique in the fact that we've got 13 sites um, in Scotland, but we had never in the world had they all been brought together under, under one trail. So I think this was another example of where um, we could tell the story of um, Scotland's heritage, both natural and cultural and built. Um, and it's been um, hugely useful in terms of the reach both in Scotland, but in the UK, but also internationally and has won awards. So we are, Scotland is good at looking at things differently. Um, and I think um, the, the, the additional World Heritage um, or the UNESCO designation that is coming through uh, to join the, um, the trail at some point will be Perth as a city of craft. So there is an opportunity to bring them in board. I know that Forsenard is waiting for its status um, as well. So um, we are looking at how we can tell how we can tell the story better around things like World Heritage Sites, for example. So um, others will probably have views on new sites and the management of them. But hopefully that provides a tourism example of where we're, we're using our assets um, to help with that diaspora story. Anyone, can I ask a, a final question, uh, Brian? It's from your submission where um, it was about the recording of the, the metrics and measuring success, and you said it was quite vague, you, you felt, in, in, in the um, the strategy. And uh, if you could maybe just expand on that, and in particular what has been a theme in our previous work and everything we're doing is the wellbeing economy and wellbeing being, you know, embedded into cultural activity and whether, whether you there's metrics there around the well-being KPIs there too? Um, yeah, so I think that our comment was in response to the previous OPIT strategy, which on, on paper um, achieved a great number of its outcomes, um, but a lot of them are around about sort of stakeholder engagement and collaboration. Um, I think that the, the uh, outcome relating to an improved condition of our built environment remained at red. Um, and so I think there's something around about us making sure that we keep our eye on bigger prizes with regard to future KPIs. Uh, I mean, for example, um, we do not have any condition indicator for the nation's A, B and C listed buildings. Um, we have anecdotal evidence to say that um, the condition of them may be deteriorating, but we don't really have any transparent information. So I think sharpening some of the new KPIs into the new strategy along those lines might benefit. Um, and I use a parallel with regard to, uh, I, I, um, it's very difficult, I think, when it comes to the built heritage and to talk about it in emotive language. Um, it surrounds us all the time. But if you look to the um, natural world where they have species on danger lists, and it's very easy to articulate that risk. And I think that we don't quite have the tools available to do that quite yet as a sector. And that might be something that I think we would welcome for you know, developing KPIs. Yeah. Ilsa, did you want to come in on that point? Um, uh, yes. Um, I think that the previous strategy had a number, a high number of KPIs, and that in itself was seen as a challenge. So my understanding around where um, the current development is around measuring success for this, for this challenge was to ensure that we weren't making a long list of things to try and measure against, because that in itself takes time and resource, which, 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 which can be difficult. Um, but I would say that what we measure and, and how we measure it has to be collaborative. Um, previously, there have been challenges because of time and resource that, that some of the measures have maybe come directly from Historic Environment Scotland, which is understandable in, in certain aspects regarding the, their estate. But it's ensuring that the measures that are put in place are suitable for organisations of all scale. Because I think um, 
the range of scale of organisations across the sector is perhaps something we haven't quite emphasised yet. I mean, we've spoken about communities and, and the challenges from community groups, but actually the number of organisations and the scale of those organisations is incredibly variable, but it will take all of them to be able to see themselves reflected within the strategy and, and within the outcomes and those measures. So I think that there will be... Um, some, some work to be done in, in that regard to, to narrow those down, but I'm aware that um, the, the, the team involved are mindful of that. And, and I'm, I, yes, I'm, I'm optimistic. Okay. Does anyone else want a final comment? Can, can I thank everyone? It's been a, a long session this morning, but really, really helpful. And um, again, thank you not only for your attendance, but for the submissions that were put in beforehand. And on that note, I'm going to close this meeting. Thank you.